Αγρεφθείς ουρανόθεν, προσεύσε βίαν έδοξε, τι τους ιωφθέντος δυνάμει, διελάφου ευστάθιε, ποικίλους καθυπές της πείρας μους, και ύστραψα σε να θλισιέρεις, Specifically, welcome to the holy and sacred space of the Saint of Stathios Chapel as well, too. It's our blessing to be able to host this day retreat all in anticipation of what will take place later this afternoon, which is the reception of a relic, a piece of bone from the holy and great martyr Saint of Stathios. Uh, as we know, we will have two lectures offered to us today by the Reverend Dr. Christopher Thesaurus. It's our great honor and blessing to have him with us on this weekend and here central to these days of great blessing to our community. Allow me at this time to introduce Father Christopher before inviting him forward to address us with his first talk this afternoon. Reverend Dr. Christopher Flesaurus is the pastor of Saints Anna Greek Orthodox Church in Roseville, California, a parish of the Greek Orthodox Metropolis of San Francisco. A graduate of Hellenic College with his BA in Religious Studies, Father Christopher then received his Master's in Divinity from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, our seminary. His MS in Development and Counseling in Higher Education from Northeastern University and his PhD from the University of California, Davis in the Foundations of Education and Christian Pedagogy in the Byzantine East. He was married to Kristen Kyriazis of Blessed Memory on October 13, 1996, at St. Sophia Cathedral in Los Angeles, California. On November 17, 1996, he was ordained to the Holy Diaconate by His Eminence Metropolitan Anthony of San Francisco, of blessed memory, at his home parish of the Annunciation in Modesto, California, and assigned to serve Holy Cross Church in Belmont, California. Deacon Christopher was then ordained to the Holy Priesthood by Metropolitan Anthony at Holy Cross Church on February 2, 1997, where he would serve until his assignment to St. Anna Church in June of 2001. In 2010, Father was commissioned as a chaplain, first lieutenant, with the California State Military Reserve and attached to the 115th Regional Support Group of the National Guard. In 2014, he was released to the California Air National Guard, commissioned as a chaplain, the rank of captain, and attached to the 162nd Combat Communication Group. He now serves the 195th wing of the Air National Guard. Father Christopher serves as adjunct professor at William Jessup University, teaches courses in both the history department as well as biblical and theology. He also serves as adjunct assistant professor of historical theology at Fuller Theological Seminary. In addition to historical theology, his areas of interest are the pastoral, pastoral care of the Byzantine Monastery of Panukrapa and its relevance to Christian wellness in the 21st century, Christian formation, the sanctity of Christian betrothal, marriage and family, and the nature and experience of suffering. He resides in Roseville, California with his children. Built on top of all of these official accolades and achievements of Father Christopher, perhaps the most representative introduction that I could give is that he's one of the most authentic Christian men that I've ever encountered. With that being said, uh, allow me to once again re-emphasize what an honor it is for us here at St. Basil's to have Father Christopher address us on this beautiful day and to welcome him to the podium to address us as a community. Thank you, Father Luke. He has to say those nice things I beat him in chest last night. 
Father Luke and I have known each other for how many years now? Man. When Father first came to Stockton, uh, which is in proximity to where we reside, uh, we had the occasion to meet and became dear friends. And as the year passed, as the years passed, um, you know, thank God we were able to become Kumbadi through his uh, beautiful little son Vasili that we have the privilege of being uh, godparents of. So it's always nice uh, being able to be with you and your family and community. And yesterday was a fitting way to begin. We celebrated liturgy together for the Feast of St. Gregory. And his father and I both noted uh, the beauty of uh, St. Gregory was his, also his proximity as a friend, a dear friend of St. Basil. So how nice it is for brothers to dwell together and what a joy it is to be here with you tonight. So I will, I have the privilege of being with you today and tomorrow to celebrate divine services as well. And today what we're going to do is explore uh, a few topics. The first just being this idea of, of saints, holy men and women, this concept of the cloud of witnesses that we hear of in scripture. And then this afternoon we're going to transition to the concept of shrine, holy relics, that we'll touch a little bit on first uh, this morning. And then also the concept, or I should say the idea of, uh, well, the person of St. Eustachius, but then also how do we understand his relic being here? What does that mean for your community? And that's really just going to be more of an, uh, an opportunity for us to talk. So as Father knows, and as my students would know at school, I don't like lecturing. Um, I like having a conversation. So if you have a question as we're going through, please just interrupt me. Um, I could talk on and on and on, and my kids can affirm that for you. And if you're not learning from what I'm offering, then it's some failing. I'd much rather have you stop me and ask if there's a question, if we need a little bit more clarity, um, or if we want to put it in a different direction, I'm completely comfortable with that too. Fair? Yeah. We're sure. <laughs> okay. All right. So, when I was putting together uh, my talks, I'm going to be coming back to some quotes as we work our way through, and I thought what would be fun, or fun for lack of a better word, is utilizing <clears throat> sayings from various saints within our tradition. So rather than just having my words, I'll just be interspersed with these words of various um, men and women throughout the centuries. So to begin with a thought, this is from St. John the Dwarf in the 4th century. And what a title of remembrance, St. John the Dwarf. I will invent a man composed of all the virtues, he would rise early at dawn every morning, take up the beginning of each virtue, and keep God's commandments. He would live in greater patience, fear, and long-suffering in the love of God, with a firm purpose of soul and body, and deep humility and patience, and trouble of heart, and earnest of practice. He would pray often with sorrow of heart, keeping his speech pure and his eyes controlled. He would suffer injury without anger, remaining peaceful, and not rendering evil for evil, nor looking out for the faults of others, nor puffing himself up meekly subject to every creature, renouncing material property and everything of the flesh. He would live as though crucified in struggle and lowliness of spirit and goodwill and spiritual abstinence and fasting and penitence and weeping. He would fight against evil, be wise and discreet in judgment and chaste in mind. He would receive good treatment with tranquility, working with his own hands, watching at night, enduring hunger and thirst, cold and nakedness and labor. He would live as those buried in a tomb and already dead, every day feeling death to be near it. So, it was easy for this early desert father to, I imagine, craft the ideals of what it would look like to be a saint, or what the ideal person would be. It's far more difficult to live it. And I think for most of us, at least for myself, if I were to have a few of these attributes, I'd be, oh, my kids would be pleased, my parishioners would be pleased, I'd be a bit happier as well. Now the challenge is just little by little being in process. The process of virtue begins when for us as Christians? When does our life in Christ begin? Baptism. Yeah, so we could, there's that one marker, baptism. Um, in light of the court case or the recent decision of, of the New York State uh, with regards to abortion, you know, something we forget, and I've actually, I, I go back to it from time to time, and I haven't written on it yet, but I'd like to, is it's amazing to think that if we have an Orthodox Christian woman that conceives of a child, and if this woman is fasting and praying, and she's communing, what a profound effect that's actually having on the child in her womb. So the child, by virtue of being completely nourished on mom, is already in his or her process of becoming a Christian. 
Because the child is receiving the Eucharist anytime the mom receives the Eucharist. So we can use baptism, of course, as the appropriate marker, but the process of becoming like Christ actually begins in the womb, from the time of conception, and starts playing it forward with mom's disciplines as a Christian. At the time of birth, if we're, I guess, following the prescribed practices of the church, we would say the prayers at the time of uh, birth, actually they're the prayers at the time of, or prior to conception, which we'll get into later in the concept of our parish. The eighth day blessings, the prayers on the 40th day, then we come to the rite of baptism. And what's beautiful about the rite is in order for one to be considered a Christian, it's a little bit of a divergence, but one has to be anointed. Because the Old Testament understanding of being Christ-like, that he said, was anointed. So water is really important in baptism, oil is equally important, and the concept of chrismation thereafter is super essential to life in Christ. We good? Okay. So, within that space of baptism, within that rite itself, we have that beautiful line that St. Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And as actually we were flying here, the other day from California, I elevated that line. I was thinking as a Christian, uh, this is again a little bit of a, a divergence, but, and actually Father Luke and I were speaking about this as well. It's remarkable to think that if that really is our Christian undertaking, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me to be able to humbly yet boastfully say that after living a life in Christ. Does my schedule, does, do my priorities, um, does it suggest I'm trying to move in that direction? As I was telling Father, it was interesting, I can look at my calendar, and as I change right into my parishioners, I can look at my calendar and it's so programmed out every day. So the one is, does that calendar reflect my priorities of saying it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, but it's not just through filling up time. Am I fully present? As a father, when I'm picking up my kids from school, am I present in the morning as I'm getting them ready? Am I present with my parishes? Am I present in a moment like this? Am I more distracted by? So, anyway, we hear it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And if we look at the formation of Paul, and if we look at the formation of other holy men and women, it's this lifelong pursuit of becoming like Christ. So I thought for this morning, or excuse me, this afternoon, at least this initial goal, my initial goal would be twofold. One is to understand this idea that we read in Scripture of we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The first part being, who are the witnesses that we hear in Scripture? What is this concept of witnesses? And then two, to start looking at this concept of the cult of the saints and holy relics. And this idea of the cult of saints and relics here in the United States, we're really new Orthodox, we're really new, we're, we are a really new Orthodox land. And even hearing the concept of the cult of saints and relics, it's still forward, it's not a part of our, uh, what would you say, our flavor yet, our maturity as a church, uh, which I think actually becomes a little bit fun. What do we do when we have relics? What does it look like? How do we access them? So that'll be part of our discussion too. So first, when it comes to holiness, what is holiness? How do we define holiness? Not rhetorical, what would you say? Together with God. Say it again? Together with God. Together with God, okay. What else? Theology. What is, which is? Together with God. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be like God. Trying to be like God, okay. And St. Athanasius has this great quote. Uh, if you haven't read On the Incarnation, great book to read. Actually, here's a little, sorry, another divergence. But um, Athanasius wrote these two books. C.S. Lewis did this great bridge introduction to both. He said, it's great for you to go back and read On the Incarnation, but the reason you want to read, if, once you get this incarnational theology, the book you've got to read is on the life of St. Anthony. If you just read the life of St. Anthony, it's not going to make sense because you're not going to understand how St. Anthony could do all these wonderful things in the desert, which is incarnate theology. So you've got to have it based in the text. 
So Athanasius has this great quote of saying, God became man so man could become like God. Yeah, like God or God. Not becoming God himself, but becoming like God. So that would be another attribute of holiness. What else could we say? What is the Greek word for holy? Ayers, which means? Hmm? No, okay, so here yeah, we're thinking of uh, Gaia, would be the great English word, right? Of Mother Earth. Well, if you put the little A in front of it, ah, right? All of a sudden we're not of. Yeah, not of this earth. So we're almost citizens that are passing through. We have great value for the world in which we live, realizing that we're meant to be stewards of it, but we're not so much tied to the earth. So this concept of being aios, of being holy, goes back into the Old Testament, and we hear in Leviticus, you shall be sanctified and you shall be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then God twice, twice repeats that to Moses, of the importance of being holy. And when we're looking at these various Old Testament words, that word that we're going to have in the Greek and the Septuagint is going to be idols. From the Old Testament, if we springboard into the New, we have be perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And this concept of perfection is idols. And there's New Testament after New Testament example of this idea of being holy. The, oh, which is ultimately just being a reflection of God, right? Because God is the holy. God is the good. God is love. God is, we have this positive, these positive ways of identifying God. So, when Paul writes in his epistles, Paul sometimes references the saints of a particular place. The saints who are in Ephesus, the saints who are in it. What does St. Paul mean? Who's he speaking to when he's thinking of the saints of a community? Christians. Christians. Okay. So, one understanding of our gathering today is we are saints. Based on Paul's terminologies. How is that possible? Okay, so when we receive the Eucharist, we're holy. Good, okay. What's great about liturgy, and I'm glad you actually put us in that direction, liturgy's movement. In fact, I um, was speaking with a few folks this past fall, I had the occasion again to be on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and when we were in the Church of, of the Nativity, what's beautiful on the walls of the church are these angels they reveal that they're being restored right now. And the angels actually show movement. So as you see them, they're not just stagnant on the walls. It looks like they're actually progressing. And the question is where they're progressing, but they're progressing toward the sanctuary. So one, you could say they're progressing toward the place where the Lord was born, or I think more correctly from a Eucharistic standpoint, they're progressing toward the place where the Eucharist is celebrated. And for us, we kind of mirror that movement with advancing from the narthex into the nave, and then ultimately to the place where we would receive the Eucharist. So besides just that physical movement, we also have that spiritual movement with the liturgy, where when it comes time tomorrow when we sing um, the Cherubic Hymn, let us lay aside all worldly cares, and as we advance a little bit further into the service, Father will come out and peace be unto all, and we have that let us love one another. The idea is that we're, we're laying aside all worldly care. There's this more so this finding of peace, of love, of grace that's existing between priests and community, or I should say the clergy and the community, in the company of. And when we come to the point of the Eucharist, and it's actually one of my favorite prayers with the liturgy, the time of the consecration of the gifts. So everyone's kneeling, sometimes we're singing, sometimes the prayers are being real loud. But the priest in one moment says, and make, let's see, send the grace down upon us, and upon these gifts. And I always throw that little extra comma in right there. Make us and these gifts. So it's saying up to that point, we come as unique individuals as we did this morning to, or this afternoon, even to this gathering, but within the context of liturgy, because of our commonality of baptism and of chrismation being prepared to receive the Eucharist, we start focusing on the holiness of the body, not that any of us is righteous unto ourselves, 
But this movement, the prayers, and are being set up for that moment within the Eucharist to, in fact, commune with God perfectly. Make sense? Questions so far? Nothing? Father Luke, how long do we have today? No, I mean, really, what is our time frame? An hour for the first talk. Okay. Break, an hour for the so prompt me every now and then just to remind me where we're at, too. I don't want to speak over. I have a question. Please. Uh, you mentioned earlier with the Christian life science of conception. Mm-hmm. And then when we do the baptism, before the baptism, we have the catechumen uh, service. Mm-hmm. Why would that be that room service that if they but to be baptized as we receive the uh, So, gosh, I mean, that's, there's so many questions on this one. There's so many thoughts I could share. The church does not acknowledge the fact that the child is already Christian by virtue of mom receiving the Eucharist. The church does not say that. But I think if we're looking at the concept of becoming fully human and becoming fully in the image of Christ, it does start from the time of conception. And there's something profound about the mother receiving the Eucharist and the baby being nourished by the body and blood of Christ within the womb. Also, if we go back to the prayers of catechumens, the prayers of the catechumens weren't meant for infants. Those were adult catechumens. And we see a noted shift within the 4th century where what was a normal normative rite of, of baptizing adults, there were kids and families that were baptized as well, but the normative rite shifts to infants when we have uh, the legalization of Christianity. And the reason being simply is the church had basically baptized all the adults. So mom and dads are baptized, and the question is, who do you baptize? Well, we have an earlier, much earlier practice of baptizing kids, so our baptismal rite really shifts and, and starts embracing more of an infant tradition. So the prayers of, prayers of catechumens, not to trivialize them by any means, uh, don't really fit infant baptism as much as they do an adult, ultimately. Because for us, today, when does catechism start for a child? But it's post-baptism. That's as they start aging with mom and dad, as they start aging within the church community, that's when religious education takes place, formally and informally, just the lives that the family lives. So, again, the church would not teach the fact that kids have already become Christian from their mom's womb. But there's something important for us with others saying that the sanctity of life, that if a child is receiving from they're already on this movement toward holiness. Which also doesn't trivialize the importance of various rites that we move through. So, St. Paul writes to his communities and refers to the people as saints. And that really is the body of believers within a particular region. The term, though, eventually starts to take on a special quality for those that are the friends of God. And the friends of God not simply being those within a local body, but those who have reposed in Christ. And the first group we would imagine within the early church would be who? Who would be the first almost friends of God? The fathers. Yeah, actually, wouldn't be the apostles. Well, you could say the apostles, but they ended their lives in martyrdom, and that would be the key. So the first group that are referenced as the saints, in the term way we use it today, would be the martyrs. Which is why, ultimately, in every altar, there's always, when a church is consecrated, we have relics of a martyr put into the altar table. And the reason being is the church is founded upon the blood of martyrs. This is another little bit of a sidebar, but I think kind of interesting is that how many types of baptism are there? You can be baptized how many ways? So you can be baptized in water. Well, no, you can only be baptized one time, right? But. You can be baptized in water. You can be baptized with tears. We hear that in the thief up on the cross. Because sometimes folks will come back and say, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. So it's a matter of just professing a belief. And the early church says, no, 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 he was absolutely baptized. He was baptized with tears of repentance on the cross. And those tears washed away his sin. And the third mode would be through blood, martyrdom. Because there were some that were not Christian who uh, didn't have the luxury of being baptized in moments, and maybe were so inspired by even the life of the Saint of Stathios, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm a Christian, I want to believe in this God that allowed this individual or this family to give their lives and, and to, be, to be sanctified or to give their lives unto death. So a priest didn't run forward and say, okay, let me baptize you first. It was 
being led up for martyrdom and that blood was considered to be a mode of baptism. Also, there was the feet that the, the apostles were baptized, but uh, Jesus was the feet, so that was a form of baptism. Mm, some, you might find that within early text, might, uh, a foot washing, might. And in early baptismal documents, you actually don't have that so much reference. The key for the apostles really, or the disciples really, is the event of Pentecost. That isn't so much about a washing as a fulfilling. That's kind of an interesting group to look at too, as far as disciples and were they baptized or not. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. And an interesting one. So part of my studies were in early in, in Christian rite of initiation. So I, I really like all of that. So when we come back to the, the martyrs, we hear on the feast of All Saints, which for us is commemorated the first Sunday following Pentecost. We hear, adorned by the blood of thy martyrs throughout all the world as in purple and fine linen, your church through them does cry unto you, O Christ God, send down your compassions upon your people and grant peace to your commonwealth and great mercies to our souls. So there was this idea that the martyrs holy men and women and children that gave their lives for Christ, became intercessors. Immediately understood as intercessors. Which is why, again, their relics were found in all the tables. And why the first churches that were built, many of the first churches were built over these spots where individuals were martyred. So it could be a very simple marker. It could be very, just a profound church. Uh, or a very significant structure that was built to mark a spot of someone's martyrdom. Think of any examples of a church that was built over where someone was martyred? St. Yeah, St. Demetrius would be a great example of that. Yeah, in fact, down below we have a place where he was held in prison, a um, place of his martyrdom, and then up, up top is the church, and then his relics kept off to the side. Any others? Yeah, the Holy Sepulchre itself. Yeah, absolutely. If you have not seen, um, if you have not seen the National Geographic special on the Holy Sepulchre and the Restoration, I would encourage you to go to I think it's Net Geo online. It is a magnificent study of looking at the design of the building of that church, the Holy Sepulchre, from what it probably looked like initially with the edicule, and that's with the actual tomb, to um, what it later became throughout all these various centuries. And how when they went to the restoration project, they dug down, went to another level, lower level, and then what found uh, when they did the, the, the study of the, uh, the rock down below, or the cement that was used in the cement of the uh, grout, uh, that dates from the third century, which suggests the fact that the church is actually there, and everything that we claim at the time of Helen and finding the church and so on is substantiated. Remarkable, remarkable uh, event. And in the... Andrew. Mm -hmm. Andrew. Yeah, the church of St. Andrew Pathos, absolutely. I can take credit for that. That was my life. Nice job. And that was a, was a nice uh, what is it, uh, working together as family, which will come to the shrine of Roseville. Speak some humility here. And then some. And be proud of the humility. <laughs> Don't actually that would be advice. That didn't happen. We're smartness. <laughs> <laughs> so. As time goes on, this concept of sainthood, of, of holiness, expands from the local body through the martyrs and starts embracing the various vocations within the church. And at the time of the consecration within service, it's, I think it's beautifully articulated that the prayer either in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom or the liturgy of St. Basil says that as we, as we kneel and we pray that the gifts be consecrated, that we gather with the forefathers, fathers, patriarchs, prophets, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, ascetics, and every righteous spirit made perfect in faith. And the reality is, thanks be to God, each of us falls into one of those categories. But we're looking specifically at men and women and children from each and every century that God has identified, and in turn the people have affirmed this man, this woman, this child, 
He is in fact holy. So every time we celebrate the liturgy, which in its fullness, so if we were to celebrate liturgy uh, in this chapel today or tomorrow or for the church tomorrow, that local Eucharistic assembly is the fullness of the faith, right? the complete fullness of who we are. But it's not because of simply what we do here. It's because of being connected with a much larger church. But it's also realizing the liturgy that's celebrated is celebrating with those that have come before us. Forefathers, fathers, patriarchs, prophets. But it's also being celebrated with those that have yet to come. I think that's one of the coolest thoughts about it as well. There's another beautiful quote of St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain that says, Just as in the physical heaven the fixed stars are divided into six orders of magnitudes, so also the saints who shine in the spiritual heaven are distinguished into six orders. Apostles, martyrs, prophets, hierarchs, monastic saints, and all the righteous. It's nice. And another saint, Silouan the Athenite, a little bit lengthier, but just beautifully written. In the kingdom of heaven, where dwell the Lord and his most pure mother, abide all the saints. There live our holy forefathers and patriarchs who valiantly carried their faith before them. There dwell the prophets who receive the Holy Spirit and by their exhortations call the people to God. There dwell the apostles who died in the gospel might be preached. There dwell the martyrs who gladly gave their lives for the love of Christ. There dwell the holy prelates who followed the Lord's example and took upon themselves the burdens of their spiritual flock. There dwell the holy fathers who lives, whose lives of prayer and fasting and those who assumed folly for Christ's sake and all who fought the good fight and thereby overcame the world. There dwell all the righteous who kept God's commandments and vanquished their passions. I think it's just such a beautiful way of looking at that concept of heaven too. So the cloud of witnesses that Paul references, it's not that it's been expanded, because I think that would be the wrong way of looking at scripture, but it's been more understood or, or better understood as the years have passed. And that image of this cloud becomes this protective cloud where all the saints dwell. And the question is, where is this cloud? And we would say, well, most profoundly, of course, within divine services, we're not thinking of so much a physical location, but we're saying it's a place with God. And when we read scripture, we have these various references to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, or the kingdom of heaven. So, having recently been in the Holy Lands, we as Christians ought to be incredibly passionate about the Holy Land. I think there's really any place that as Christians, we should be united as a people. Right? It's our concern for all those holy sites um, in Jerusalem. Because it is remarkable to think that that's where the Lord was buried. That's where the Lord was born. That's where he preached. That's where he was baptized. Right? That's sacred ground for all. And what's also beautiful is think of our churches there in the Holy Land. On a daily basis, the discipline even say the church of the nativity. Every morning, the brothers get up, they celebrate the divine liturgy. Every day when liturgy comes to a close, few of the fathers attached to the church of the nativity go into the town because they, actually it's a functioning parish. We forget that. The church of the nativity is a functioning parish. So the priest there does visitations. He leads a Bible study. They have a youth group. It's just remarkable to think. I always think of these places as far removed in almost these historical sites, but it's a thriving Christian community. But in addition, we offer this ongoing hospitality to tens of thousands of Christians every single day that access that space. But as remarkable as each of these sites are within the Holy Land, the church in its fullness, and it's not to take away from any of those sites, the church in its fullness is found here in Houston. The liturgy here is no less significant than the church in any grand cathedral, uh, be it here in the United States or abroad. It's no less significant than the liturgy of the Holy Sepulchre in the fourth or fifth century, in whatever historical language it was celebrated in. That's just this weird Christian sense of nostalgia and romanticizing. If the gospel isn't living in a local community, then that concept of the heaven almost ceases locally. So if Jerusalem or Israel as a nation, and hear me on this, I think it makes sense, 
if, it, if the region didn't exist, the kingdom of heaven continues regardless because it's not a physical location. That's kind of a misplaced Western, Western Christian understanding of Israel and the significance of. Because ultimately, if we understand our theology, we are new Israel, with no disrespect to old Israel. But new Israel is here in Houston, new Israel is in Roseville, California, new Israel is in Baltimore, Maryland, maybe in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, that's our dear friend that's a priest there. I just have to always, we always pull through things his way. But that's the concept of new Israel. So we don't think so much of a physical location, instead we think of the place where the saints abide. And there's a beautiful quote. Here it is, St. John Chrysostom. The memory, which is a living memory, of those saints establishes and recovers the soul. So we think of this cloud, which has been exhausted by ills as a cloud that provides shade from the most flaming heat of the sun's rays. He, that is St. Paul, did not say lift it on high above us, but which is set around us, which creates for us a greater freedom from fear, because they ever intercede protecting on all sides, inspiring to us, the church militant, in the battle against the enemy. So this cloud, I think Chrysostom does such a nice job of saying it, isn't, again, it's not this idea that the cloud is above us. That's really Old Testament, above us. The concept of stead is the cloud is we're in the midst of it. And Father Peter, that was my uh, proestomino in Belmont when I was his assistant or my senior priest, there's a cemetery in Half Moon Bay. So leaving Belmont, driving up Highway 92, one finds, you kind of descend up, and it's this beautiful cemetery. What makes a cemetery beautiful, besides having the coast down in the distance, is there's normally a cloud just hovering right on the mountain. So in order to get to the cemetery, you actually go into the cloud. I remember the first time up there with Father Peter, he just kind of stood and he said, ah, this is, this to me is, this is a cemetery. Because you just get this Old Testament feeling that God dwells here. That feeling that that space evoked for him is that same understanding, though, that Chrysostom says. It's, it's the cloud in which we find ourselves of the saints, protected on every side. The question is, I guess, I should say, one of the questions would be, do we allow ourselves to be protected by the saints? Do we call them friends? Do we have relationships with them? You know, if not, then we're really not acknowledging the blessing of being in that cloud. Questions at this point? Thoughts? Isn't the liturgy, when we celebrate it, or we, the church militant, is celebrating it with the church right? And the saints are well in the church triumphant. So every time we go to the liturgy, we are in the same spot as the church triumphant, right? Mm -hmm. The saints. So they are with us at every liturgy because they're in the same position as we are, right? Other than <coughs> the different realms that we exist in, you know, we're, we are celebrating the same liturgy together. So that bond between us and the saints, or the people who have gone before us, mm -hmm. um, exists every time we come in and celebrate. So tomorrow is my, my grandfather's, my paternal grandfather's uh, passing, and my dad's dad. And my father would note, um, years ago, I remember him saying after my grandfather passed, the place he feels most comfortable or the most connected to his father within services is the time of kneeling. He said, you know, I just, he said, whatever, for whatever reason in that moment when I'm kneeling, he goes, I just, I think of my father being in proximity to me. Um, and my dad was well up, you know, talking about it. And it's so interesting because if we actually, if, you know, let's say the big if, and not being disrespectful, but if my grandfather were in, in God's kingdom, the place he would be nearest to my father ever in any moment would be in the divine liturgy. And the prayer at the time of the consecration says we're gathering with all those individuals you mentioned. It's just, again, whether we allow ourselves to come into that company or not. Because as much as personal prayer is important, and we should live incredibly a lot, my dedicated lives of personal prayer, the liturgy can't be replaced. You know, I'm spiritual, but I don't go to church. And I have no idea what that means. And that's a lot of California. Yesterday we were talking about California. Right? That's California. We're spiritual. We're not Christian. People have outgrown their, their Christianity. 
or I'm an Orthodox Christian, but I really don't participate fully in the life of the church. And there are reasons sometimes why that's the case. And the church, though, is an institution of healing and wholeness, and healing really stems from the liturgy. Because we allow ourselves in that moment to be humble, to be in this gathering. And this afternoon, or a little bit later, we'll spend some time going through the life of St. Estathius. And, and this is such a remarkable and sacred space. And the iconography is beautiful, the history behind you know, the building of, of even the church having this space. It's humbling. But also to see how it's used with a prominent baptismal font with having the altar and a relic that will be enshrined here. Then the question is, what do you do with this space going forward to remind folks that this is the company in which we, niche, we, in which we need to find ourselves on a regular basis? You know, Bible study is good. Um, reading books is good. Celebrating the liturgy and being in sacred space is better. Nothing against any of those things, but we can't understand ourselves or Christianity without being in the midst of the church. Other questions or thoughts? Father? Whether it's in this talk or maybe in the next, maybe you could also develop what then is the responsibility of talking about the experience. So we come, we experience that together as God and the saints in the context of the liturgy. And then um, when the divine service is concluded, now you go out into your life from extrapolating this experience of holiness, now it's the responsibility of the faithful to apply it. Mm -hmm. So whether it's in this talk or in the next, if we could hear your thoughts on that, I think it would be sure substance. That. I think the, the initial thought would be if, if, if I knew, I'd like to think I'd be doing it. Um, that's the ongoing struggle of the Christian life. It's thinking how, you know, think tomorrow when you were in the celebration of the Divine Liturgy. Um, you have a large community, and as the years pass, it will only become a bigger community. One of the challenges with large communities, and even our community, we, we have a few hundred people, our, our space is, is kind of blown out, we're in the process of uh, preparing to build a church so we can accommodate more. But even with a few hundred families, it's really challenging for folks to know one another. And there's something beautiful about all of us going up to receive the Eucharist, but there's also something tragic about us going up to receive the Eucharist and not knowing who we're celebrating the liturgy with, which does suggest one of our first obligations is to get to know our own people. So if you don't know the person you're sitting next to, you know, even here, when we depart, introduce yourselves. Because the liturgy is not an individual institution. It's not to simply receive the Eucharist and go one's way. It's to live in community and fellowship with this greater body. And then if you push that forward, there was a professor from Greece that has since passed away uh, who was studying the, or who studied the concept of ecclesiology, what it is to be the church. And I thought he gave such a beautiful understanding of a definition of the church. And it's, I think it's incredibly progressive and um, embracing. We say at the center, we have the Orthodox Church, that we say is the fullness of the faith. And history, um, every aspect of, of history says we are in fact the church. It's with no disrespect to anyone else or intentionality, but Historically, we'd say we're the fullness. Well, outside of this little circle, you get a little bit of a bigger circle. And that bigger circle is made up, let's say, of, of Roman Catholics, High Church Anglicans, others that are going to have similar theological uh, uh, standings, and maybe some of the same liturgical practices. Well, then there's a bigger circle. You've got this whole group of Christians um, that, let's say, are all baptized, but with different theologies and such. Well, then you've got a bigger circle of just all those Christians that believe in God but have never been baptized. Well, then you've got a bigger circle of all those who believe in God but aren't Christian. Then you've got a bigger circle that really just then becomes all of humanity. So the neat thing as Orthodox Christians is we're continually working from the circle of the liturgy. So when we went out and had breakfast this morning or on a Sunday after you advanced to wherever it is in your day, you're reaching into the next level of circle. You're just trying to remain your Christian, or maintain your Christian integrity going into the next circle. And what are we doing? We're not being critical of the next circle. 
But when we go into it, we're going in and inviting people to come into the fullness. And if they don't, we still love them. And we support them where they're at. Not being critical. But trying to find commonality and goodness. There's a lot more joy in that too. So that's maybe a simple way of looking at it for now. So when it comes to looking to these men and women or this cloud of witnesses, a blessing for us is that we have history, we have hypnography, we have iconography, we have the lives of these saints that have been recorded. And we're able to go back to them and read them and be mentored by them. We find, this is a nice little saying, these texts and their narratives of a style of life in which human self-love has been conquered and the grace of God revealed have always had a special place in the Orthodox Church. The faithful are nurtured daily by them in their spiritual life. Like what a nice thought that is, that on a daily basis, we're able to read Old Testament, or excuse me, Epistle, Gospel, the life of the saint of the day. So yesterday, we celebrated the Feast of St. Gregory. Why was the Gospel the gospel selected for yesterday, the gospel reading. Anybody remember what the gospel was? Or for St. John Chrysostom, which I think was the same reading. I am the shepherd. Talks about the shepherd knowing his sheep. Why was that reading selected? Because they're bishops. Because St. Gregory was a bishop. So the reading our day, when we look at our liturgical calendar, is driven by the feast. So that particular reading was because we celebrated St. Gregory, which tells us, in order for me to understand what I'm reading on a daily basis as far as scripture, I've got to go back and read the life of the saint for the day, too. So I allow myself to go back in and read these remarkable stories and to be nurtured by them. St. John of Kronstadt says, We ought to have the most lively spiritual union with the dwellers in heaven, as they are all members of the one body, the Church of Christ, to which we sinners also belong, and the living head of which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is why we call upon them in prayer, converse with them, and praise them. It is urgently necessary for every Christian to be in union with them if he desires to make Christian progress. For the saints are our friends, our guide to salvation, who pray and intercede for us. So what that means is we have to be condemned become familiar with our friends. And if I think of groups in which I'm involved, think of how long sometimes it takes those relationships to be nurtured, or sometimes how quickly they come. But I've got to put myself out there and be vulnerable in order to develop a relationship. I've got to invest some time. So it might be becoming familiar with the iconography. It might be becoming familiar with hymnography. It might be simply going back and reading the life of. But otherwise, the relationship really never will be nurtured. There's a beautiful writing from Saints, or I should say, the Elder Cleopa. And it's something that we as Orthodox Christians probably get asked or criticized on a regular basis about these concepts of saints that we go to. But they don't bring salvation, but Christ does. So he responds, it is true that no one except Christ is able to intercede before the Father, since only he presents himself as a sacrifice for the salvation of the world. Accordingly, no one except Christ is able to save man from sin. However, in honoring the saints, we don't put them in a place of Christ, or even adjacent to him. When the saints pray for us, it is precisely our salvation that they seek from Christ. They intercede with him for our salvation. From Christ, they entreat our salvation. This is what we mean when we say that they intercede for us. By their prayers, the saints make petition for our salvation, not, however, as if they themselves have the power to save, for only the one who saves is Christ. Thus, we do not venerate the saints and angels as we do God. And then he kind of goes on and on and on. And I thought this is just such a clever thought. Even if we were wrong, okay, imagine, imagine if the Orthodox were wrong with our veneration of the saints, that we shouldn't have all of this. He gives us great kind of little thought. Just as no one can approach Christ without the saints who are members of the body. Oh, no, here it is here. Here it is right here, I'm sorry. For how is it possible for God to be angry upon seeing his precious and beloved friends being magnified in his name? 
when he himself has glorified them, endowed them with wonder-working power, and granted them exceptional spiritual gifts. So even if we were wrong, how could God be mad at us for saying, these men and women that gave their lives for, that gave their lives for you, that were so filled with grace, we honor them, we glorify them, God could only be well-pleased with us for doing so. Which I think is such a beautiful thought. So when folks do challenges in this context of saints, and actually what I would say, instead of using the word saints, which comes with baggage, especially in some of our greater communities of Christians, the word I much prefer now is just we refer to the holy ones. So the, um, what, the holy hierarch Basil, the holy hierarch, the holy martyr Stathios, the holy ancestor of God Anna, which is maybe a little bit laborious on our side having to figure out what their proper titling is, but it doesn't come with that same baggage of saints. Because what that means is we worship them which we don't. But if we're trying to appeal to a much greater audience, we have to be thoughtful about some of our words, too. At least for the last few minutes, five minutes, is that about where we're at? I want to introduce this idea of the cult of saints. So, the early church, or I should say Jews, and then working their way into the early Christian experience, did not have this concept of movement as much as we have today. We would hear about the Jews going to the temple, um, or they would go to the synagogue and maybe there was this movement toward the temple. But the early church also was pretty inhospitable to this concept of movement, of going to various places to venerate and to um, spend time in just particular spaces. They were also, I should say, Jews were also really um, cautious, for lack of a better word, from death. So dead bodies were sub considered something that were impure, unpure. And it really wasn't until um, the fourth century, and if, if you're in the medical profession, there's some great books that have been done on Byzantium in the hospital, because it wasn't until the fourth century Byzantium that the concept of the Christian hospital evolves, the hospitals we know it today evolves. Before that, if somebody were to die, Rome and others would just leave the bodies out. Christians were the ones that would go and gather the remains to ensure that individuals had the dignity of bury, uh, burial. But prior to, the body was considered something that was fallen, that was something dirty, it was corrupting. So if we were Jews and we were to come upon a dead body, and I came in contact with it, then I would be considered ceremonially unclean. And I would have to go and wash before and be purified before I would go back to the temple, before I'd be allowed back in. Practical reasons for that too. But there seem to be some exceptions in the rule. We see in the Old Testament this idea of the relics, the remains of the forefathers were processed back to be in or in proximity to the fathers. We hear of what in Kings where um, they lowered a body in the bones of Elisha. And what happened? But the person was resurrected by coming in contact with the body of Elisha, the bones. So whether those relics were being processed or whether in this case remains were put on top of, those remains seem to be different than just a typical body. Come along with an early Christian experience, and this just being the first few centuries, because of the Lord's resurrection in fully body, in full body, not just as a figment, but as a full body, the understanding of, of death slowly started to evolve because it's no longer I who lives but Christ that lives in me. Those who have died in Christ live in Christ. That's why the funeral rite, it says weep, but weep as those who have hope. Because death is but a sleep, but there's still activity in sleep. So they, our understanding of remains of relics shifted. And we have that in the second century. There's this great, do I have it here? I have it here. I think I might have it in the next presentation. But the bones of Ignatius of Antioch, and this was somebody that was, they threw the lions and his remains were gnawed and they collected his relics afterwards, his bones afterwards and says, these are more precious to us than gems because God dwelled in him. Grace dwelled there. The remains of Polycarp, again, second century, those remains were more precious than gems to the community as well. So by the 4th century, there was this cult of saints. And cult just mean the followers of people that just loved and loved the saints. 
So much so that as we know, a few centuries later, as we come to celebrate the Feast of the Three Hierarchs, you had factions. Some folks love St. John so much as opposed to St. Basil, as opposed to St. Gregory. They would actually come to arms over which saint was greater. And the remains, having the remains of a saint in your midst, I mean, that was, those were bragging rights with the early church. Well, we have the relics of. Well, we have the relics of. So it's amazing to think how the church in her wisdom and God, of course, directed that the feasts of the three hierarchs be celebrated together. They are equal in the eyes, equal in the standing before God. But it's going to be within that fourth century period that we really have this cult of saints arise and this movement toward um, not just simply collecting, or I should say, not just honoring those who have died in Christ, the fathers, forefathers, patriarchs, prophets, evangelists, martyrs, contestants, and ascetics, and every righteous spirit and faith, but also taking their bodies, sometimes dismembering them, and then sending them to various churches to share with the faithful. So although some of us might make pilgrimages to the Holy Land, might go to particular churches around the world to venerate particular saints, the beauty is within the context of the liturgy, all the saints are present, but through this dismembering of saints, we then share their physical remains with communities around the world, which is also how the relic received, was received here. So, any closing thoughts or questions on this presentation? These thoughts. Could yes. You talk a little bit about how the church goes about officially recognizing saints. Is sure. There something like that. Is there a difference in the Eastern understanding versus the? Absolutely, big difference. So, I think one of the so the Western Rite or the Western Church today, it's an incredibly ordered process. One reposes, and there is this process of investigation, possibly into the life based on the holiness or the belief holiness of an individual. And as time goes on, one has to be, um, uh, one has to be, so many miracles have to be attributed to the saint in order to see that activity that God is well pleased with them. Uh, I, sorry, I lapsed when you asked the question, but I was thinking, for any of you that remember Saturday Night Live years ago, there was a character, Father Guido Sarducci. And uh, Father Guido in one of the, the sorry, I just thought it. And one of the things he was talking about a new saint from Italy, and he said one of his one of his miracles was a car trick, and <laughs> it was it was sweet. It was just a playful way of just showing that it's so rigid with how they were approaching it. The Eastern Church is entirely different. For us, and you could have a holy man or woman die in a particular community, and the community could say this person was just remarkable. You know, what a good soul. And it might not be any sort of profound um, experience, but you just look back on their lives. I think of a woman we have right. Actually, so I think of a woman in our parish that is from our sister parish in Sacramento that's with us on a regular basis. This woman has lost a husband and two children and is about 90 years old. She's outlived everybody. And she is this amazing, just righteous, godly woman that you just sense grace when you're with her. You can't help. She's playful, she's joyful, and just good. Now, God willing, and when she reposes, this is a woman that I will always keep in my mind 